Welcome to Term Talk. I'm Jim Chance, Senior Judicial Education Attorney at the Federal Judicial Center in Washington, and I'm here with Paul Clement, former Solicitor General of the United States under President George W. Bush, and a distinguished lecturer at Georgetown Law and Senior Fellow at their Supreme Court Institute. Welcome, Paul. Great to be with you, Jim. Paul, this was the first time in a decade that the court has issued opinions in this area, and this term the court heard two cases implicating the state secrets privilege and the extent to which courts have to defer to the government's assertions of that privilege. Can you get us started, please, and explain the state secrets privilege and what the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978, or FISA, does? I'd be happy to, Jim. The, the state secrets privilege is what has been described, at least by many, as a common law privilege. It's not a product of a particular statute or a particular constitutional provision. But in litigation, whether it involves the government as a party or as a non-party, if there is information that's about to be disclosed that the government believes would compromise national security if it were disclosed in open court, the government can, if it's a party, assert the privilege, or if it's not a party, intervene and assert the privilege, and essentially tell the courts that notwithstanding the information would otherwise be admissible in the case, that it can't be disclosed or used in the case at all because of the state secrets privilege. FISA, by contrast, is a statute that Congress passed in 1978 principally to regulate the gathering of intelligence information uh, when the government is seeking the information principally for intelligence purposes rather than seeking the information principally for traditional law enforcement purposes. The statute creates a variety of procedures and even a separate court uh, to govern the process of the government getting permission to do intelligence surveillance. The statute, when it was originally constructed, was really designed more for the intelligence gathering against foreign nationals and what might be thought of as spycraft. But after the attacks of 9-11, the statute was, in some respects, repurposed and used a great deal to collect information from suspected terrorist groups. And in addition to regulating how that information is gathered, there are provisions that allow the information to be used in court under certain circumstances, subject to certain limitations. And if the information is gathered unlawfully, there are also some remedies provided in the FISA statute. So, Paul, let's start with Zabeda. How did that case get to the court? Well, Jim, unlike maybe the classic state secrets case where it's a tort suit against the government and the government asserts state privilege state secrets privilege, rather, to really stop the, the tort suit in its tracks. This case arose under a procedural statute, 28 U.S.C. 1782, that allows individuals to get discovery in aid of proceedings in other court systems. And what happened here is that Zubeda, who's being detained in the Guantanamo Bay facility through his lawyers, initiated a lawsuit abroad and sought information about the place and circumstances of his interrogation uh, by CIA and CIA contractors. And so he sought that information specifically from the contractors, not from the government itself, and it did so under this vehicle of Section 1782. The government intervened to try to preclude the information from becoming public, and it, it put together an affidavit by the CIA director saying the disclosure of this information would interfere with the national security interests of the United States and would be harmful to our relations with other nations. One thing that I think is important about this case is that unlike the maybe classic state secrets privilege case where the information at issue is something that's known to no one outside of the, the government, this is a situation where the circumstances, at least the location of Zubeda's interrogation, had been pretty widely reported in non-governmental sources based on uh, information that had been provided not by the government itself. But nonetheless, even though this information was widely reported, the government itself had never confirmed uh, the specific place of Zubeda's uh, detention and interrogation. 
And the lower court dismissed the discovery request, and then the Ninth Circuit reversed, allowing the discovery in some areas to proceed. But then the Supreme Court reversed the Ninth Circuit's determination and supported the government's assertion of the privilege. So help us understand how the justices worked their way through that. Sure, Jim. The majority of the court was very deferential to the government in this case. And even though the information had been disclosed through non-governmental channels, uh, the court nonetheless deferred to the assertion by the government through the uh, CIA director that this information was harmful to national security and that the government couldn't be forced, essentially, to confirm the information in open court. And so that, the majority really was quite deferential and really found that the uh, affidavit filed by the CIA director uh, asserting the national security interests was controlling. Uh, two justices, Justice Thomas and Justice Alito, wrote separately to go really even further in terms of being deferential to the government because they would have held that because Zubeda had not shown a particularly important need for this information, given that it was public through other sources, they would have really, you know, essentially deferred to the government at the first stage of the litigation and not gone any further. All right. There were a couple of dissents as well. One partial dissent from Justice Kagan would have stopped short of dismissal, but allowed the consideration of conditions. Then there was a full dissent by two justices we don't often see on the same side of a dissent, Justice Gorsuch, who wrote the uh, dissent, and he was joined by Justice Sotomayor. Um, they objected to the degree of deference that was being given to the executive branch uh, by the majority, and they agreed that courts should be able to ask for more evidence from the government before making a determination that the grounds for such a privilege exists. I, I agree, Jim, that, that definitely the fact that Justice Gorsuch and Justice Sotomayor saw the case exactly the same way is a little bit unusual. And I think it really, in a sense, almost highlights the degree to which the rest of the court, or certainly the majority of the court, was being deferential to the government. Because Justice Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Sotomayor really didn't think that the court should have to blind themselves to the facts as reported in the media and could take a more common sense approach to the issue. Whereas the majority of the court, even though the information was otherwise public, nonetheless deferred to the government in its assertion of the state secrets privilege. And I think that shows just how deferential the current court is going to be to the government in these kind of cases. The other thing I'd note is that I do think the procedural posture of this case worked in favor of the government. State secret privilege cases traditionally are pretty hard because the government's overwhelming national security interests have a very profound effect on the individual litigant and may deny them any remedy whatsoever in a tort suit. But here, since this wasn't a direct tort suit against the government, and it was just a suit uh, essentially designed to uh, get discovery in litigation filed in a foreign court, I do think the equities of the, the plaintiff weren't as stark as in the traditional uh, state secrets case, and I think that probably worked to the government's advantage here. All right, let's take a look at the other state secrets case, FBI versus Fazaga. Uh, this was a suit under FISA seeking redress for FISA violations. Once again, the government asserts the state secrets privilege. And in this case, the plaintiff wanted the FISA rules governing release of information that could threaten national security to displace the state secrets doctrine. Help us understand this. Well, Jim, you know, the, the facts of this case would make, you know, a great made for TV movie or something because you had a government informant who infiltrated this, this, this community associated with this mosque, and then some of the members of the community were sufficiently suspicious of some of the suggestions of the government informant that they reported the government informant to the FBI. Um, and then based on that, uh, the, the, there was a suit that was eventually brought by the members of the community um, where they tried to take full advantage of the FISA statute both in terms of the remedies available under that statute when the government has conducted uh, surveillance unlawfully, but also for some of the procedural reasons, which is the FISA statute makes it easier uh, for the, the plaintiff to prompt the court to do an in-camera ex parte review of the information, whereas that's not typically allowed under the state secrets privilege, where there's more deference to the government. Uh, the court in this case 
unanimously reaffirmed that the state secrets privilege is not displaced by FISA, uh, but that the two provisions really operate independently. And Justice Alito's opinion for the court really focused on the difference between the FISA statute, which focuses on the intelligence gathering and whether the gathering of the information was lawful or unlawful, and the state secrets privilege, on the other hand, which really focuses not on the gathering of the intelligence in the first instance, but whether the disclosure of the information that has been gathered, whether it was gathered lawfully or unlawfully, is going to compromise national security if that information becomes public um, in open court. So the court really differentiated between the two concepts um, and affirmed that the state secrets privilege was applicable here, and so the government prevailed in this case as well. So correct me if I'm mistaken, Paul, but it sounds like after these two decisions, it appears that the lower courts are just going to have to be prepared to apply the dictates of both the state secrets doctrine and the FISA protections when appropriate. That's exactly right, Jim. There's certainly going to be cases where the state secrets privilege is implicated and the FISA statute is not and vice versa. But in cases like Fazada, where both, st both the FISA statute and the state secret privilege are invoked, the courts are going to have to work their way through both issues, and the plaintiffs are essentially going to have to clear both hurdles. They'll have to show that the intelligence gathering was unlawful and that the disclosure of the information does not implicate national security interests. I think if you look at these two cases together, uh, the takeaway is pretty clear. First, the, the majority of the court is going to be very deferential to the state secrets privilege, um, as, as you see in both these cases. But second, I think that the Fazada case was interesting because, as we noted at the outset, uh, the, the, the state secrets privilege is not something that is rooted in a particular statute or a particular specific constitutional provision. And it's been described by many scholars as a common law privilege. And the more conservative justices in most contexts are kind of skeptical of common law provisions or think that they are easily displaced when Congress specifically addresses an issue like it did in the FISA statute. So the fact that a majority of the court, in fact, every member of the court was willing to say that FISA does not displace the state secrets privilege really does show how committed the court is to allowing the government to assert the state secrets privilege. We said before, the, these are the first state secrets privilege cases that the court has heard in a decade. But I think a takeaway from these cases is that the state secrets privilege is alive and well in the Roberts court. And this court is going to be quite deferential to the executive branch in these cases. Paul, as always, it was a pleasure talking with you again today. Thank you for sharing your insights with us. I hope we'll talk again soon.